Hello everybody, welcome to going over some concepts that weren't covered in the study design last year because they were removed because of COVID, um, but are necessary for the 2021 exam. So I've made this video to add on to the stuff that I didn't mention in the previous summary videos. So the dot points that we're going to be covering today um, are these ones here. So anything highlighted in red, if you want to pause and have a look, you can, but we're basically going to be going through each of these ones. So the first one on our list is looking at chromosomal abnormalities. Okay, so looking at mutations, one part that was covered this year was looking at the difference between aneuploidy and polyploidy. So aneuploidy is basically where there is one extra or one less chromosome, okay, in your karyotype. So a prime example of this is trisomy 21, where we have an extra chromosome 21, which signifies Down syndrome. The difference between that and polyploidy is poly means more than one, okay? So it's where cells can obtain extra whole sets of chromosomes, okay? So triploids or losing um, two chromosomes, okay? So the gain or loss of two. Basically with aneuploidy, people can survive. Polyploidy, people can't survive, okay? So it's lethal for animals, um, but it is quite common in plants. All right, the next bit was looking at significant changes in life forms in Earth's geological history. So this is looking at how do we go from our prokaryotes to our eukaryotes? So here you need to basically understand um, the difference between a prokaryote and a eukaryote and how we've gone from being such multicellular species. So a prokaryote we know is a single-celled organism that has no um, membrane-bound organelles, so no nucleus, and it just has a circular loop of DNA. Okay, so bacteria and archaea are examples of prokaryotic organisms. Eukaryotes, on the other hand, are basically any organism that has uh, membrane-bound organelles. So in terms of this, the main thing that you kind of need to understand is sort of the order of events and how this sort of characterized. So we started off 3.5 billion years ago, um, there were prokaryotes that existed, um, eukaryotes 2 billion years ago, then the multicellular organisms, then the animals on land, then the mammals, then the flowering plants. Okay, so generalized order to be able to give you some background information to answer questions. The next part that was not covered last year in 2020, but is part of 2021, is looking at divergent, convergent evolution and what a mass extinction is. So divergent evolution basically refers to, and the way that I look to look at it, is looking at a common ancestor. Okay, so we have common ancestor and they've diverged into two separate species. There's been some sort of speciation event. Okay, um, and so these differences are usually accounted for by the differing selection pressures. Okay, so this is based on selection pressures or genetic drift. Convergent evolution, on the other hand, is looking at two species having analogous traits, okay? So they're quite similar, but not because they have a common ancestor. They're similar because they live under similar selection pressures, okay? So they're two unrelated species that sort of adapt in a similar way. And so they occupy the same niche and therefore they might have characteristics that are similar to each other. Adaptive radiation, okay, is another word that you may have come across. That's basically rapid divergent evolution, okay? So it's divergent evolution that's occurred rapidly um, where if we think of Darwin's finches, the Galapagos finches, they're a prime example of variation that's been obtained by different foods that they eat um, and the structure of their beaks. So that was adaptive radiation. A mass extinction is different to a normal extinction, extinctions where there might be just one species that all die off mass is on a large scale okay so it's where um, in earth's history there have been a relatively high number of species that have died out over a short amount of periods so there's five periods of mass extinctions that we can identify through the fossil record and one that you may have known of is um that triassic jurassic period where we say goodbye to the dinosaurs all right the next part that we looked at is looking at the mitochondrial clock and DNA hybridization. So this is all to do with relatedness. 
Okay, this fits into the relatedness component where you're looking at amino acid differences, nucleotide differences to see how closely related two species might be. So in order to track maybe like a previous divergence event, um, we can look and analyze the mitochondrial DNA. So it can act as a molecular clock. It can tell us how much time there may have been since the first divergent event between two organisms. The special thing about mitochondrial DNA is it's found in mitochondria, okay, and it is inherited maternally, okay, so through the maternal line. The way that we represent it is mtDNA, and we know that mitochondria can have DNA because they were once free living organisms. We know that when we studied cellular respiration and photosynthesis. The other part to determine relatedness is looking at DNA hybridization. So DNA hybridization is basically a technique that's been used to determine the relatedness between two different DNA strands, okay? So they're looking at the temperature at which those strands are gonna separate. So basically what we do is we take two DNAs from two species, we wanna see how related they might be. Um, we can basically use heat, okay, in this process to separate those strands. But what we're first going to do, we've got our two strands of DNA that we want. We're going to mix them together. Okay, so we're going to cool those DNA samples so that they can stick together. And basically, if it is stuck together more, there are more hydrogen bonds. That means that they're more related. And if there's more hydrogen bonds, it's going to take us a higher temperature to separate them. So we basically say that if there is a lower temperature used to break the bonds, that means the species must be less related. If we have to use a higher temperature to break the bonds, that means there's more bonds there, so that species is more likely to be closely related. All right, the next part is looking at master genes. So again, this is just overview, quick summary of all of these things. Um, if you have any questions, you can obviously keep them in the comments and I'll answer them for you. But master genes basically have a vital role in the development of particular animals. They switch genes on and off, basically. So they're a type of regulatory gene that impact um, on the development of animals. So they can basically control the expression of other genes. They can control the timing of gene expression, and they can control um, the cells in which this particular gene expression is occurring. So the um, master gene that we look at is BMP4. BMP4 is bone morphological or born bone morphogenic protein, okay, which is encoded by a master gene, okay, BMP4. Um, it's a signaling protein that's found in vertebrates. It controls like cartilage and bone development, muscle development, things like that. So we look at it in terms of two different animals that we studied. So we studied the African cichlids and the Galapagos finches. Basically, what you need to understand here is what happens if there's low BMP4 and high levels of BMP4 to the development of those two different animals. Okay, so in terms of the cichlids, BMP4, if it's low levels, that means that the jaw of these fish is relatively smaller compared to when there's high levels of BMP4, we result in larger jaws um, and more muscle mass. In the Galapagos finches, BMP4 is looking at the width, okay, of the beak. So low levels of BMP4 is a low, low beak depth and high levels of BMP4 is a wider beak, okay, a higher beak depth. CAM is another master gene, okay, it's not specifically listed in the study design, but you can also relate it to Galapagos finches. So low levels is a shorter beak, okay, whereas high levels is a more elongated beak. So don't be confused between width and length, okay, width is how thick, length is how long. The next part, all right, which we have studied quite a lot, is looking at hominin evolution. So how do we go from Australopithecus to Homo? Um, and we studied the structural and functional changes last year as well, so you can refer to those videos. Um, I've gotten this from Ed Rollo, which is very handy as well, which basically talks about the trends structurally over time. So there's some really good diagrams here that I found online as well. So looking at the cranial capacity, the brow ridge, face shape, chin, teeth, the foramen magnum positioning, the spine um, curvature, the rib cage, the arm to leg ratio, the pelvis, what happens to the big toe, the foot arch, the heel size. There's heaps there that you can compare between um, Australopithecus images 
and then column C is our homo images. What was missing last year though that wasn't discussed in the study design videos was the consequences for cultural evolution. So our ability to use our brain, okay, our cognitive ability that's improved over time, at that point we were using fire, okay, we were creating tools, the beginning of agriculture, domestication of animals, things like that are all part of cultural evolution, artistic ability, music ability, they're all things that you need to be able to draw on. All right, next bit is looking a little bit into Unit 4 Area Study 2 now, um, is looking at the difference between genetic screening and DNA profiling. So here you need to know like the implications, okay, so positive and negative reasonings for maybe doing some of this. So a genetic screen is basically a test that's used to carry out um, screening purposes to see whether a child is susceptible to a particular genetic disease. So a way that this is done is um, an example is amniocentesis where they stick a needle um, and into the pregnant mother and get um, some amniotic fluid that they can test. Okay, so they can see um, and screen for particular disease. Genetic profiling is a lot like DNA profiling. Facebook profile, who are you? <laughs> so this is a process of identification. Okay, it's also known as DNA fingerprinting. And so they're analyzing the short tandem repeats, which are just small segments of DNA um, that they get to analyze and see and can create a gel electrophoresis to match up maybe like at a crime scene or a paternity test um, if there's any DNA matches to see individuals. All right, the next bit is looking at rational drug design. So rational drug design is basically designing a drug based on its complementary ability um, to inhibit particular proteins that might be in a virus, okay? So we are specifically designing it to be complementary. The one that we look at when we're studying this is the influenza virus. So basically the influenza virus, as we can see here, has two specific types of proteins um, that are around it, and that is the hemagglutinin protein, okay, which basically enables this virus to bind to the host, and the neuraminidase protein, which is basically active at the end of infection. So once replication has occurred, what neuraminidase does is it basically cuts, acts as scissors, and cuts the um, bonds between the hemagglutinin and the host. So now this virus can free and it can escape and infect other cells. So what we wanted to do is create a drug that will inhibit the action of either hemagglutinin or neuraminidase. So we designed this drug, not we, but scientists, designed this drug called Relenza um, that acted on inhibiting the action of neuraminidase. So if it inhibits neuraminidase, that means neuraminidase can't actually cut the hemagglutinin links and means that virus cannot go and infect other cells. So that's basically what this summary is talking about. So if you would like to pause and have a read of that, um, that would be really good. And there's some images to accompany that. The final part of what was not included last year is looking a little bit more at disease management, antibiotic and antivirals. So basically you need to understand different transmission routes of different pathogens. Okay, they can be airborne, they can travel through the fecal oral route, bodily fluids, direct contact and vectors. That's all stuff that we have covered in previous videos. Um, and in terms of managing those disease um, transmission and how we can suppress that is um, very relevant now as well with COVID. So looking at preventative measures, um, hygiene, vaccinations, um, controlling food imports, immigration, surveillance, quarantine, isolation, identifying the pathogen um, and controlling the method of spread. What we didn't cover last time though was looking at, sorry my screen's going a bit funny, um, antibiotics and antivirals and how they actually work, okay, so their mode of action. So antibiotics, knowing that they can either kill the microbe directly okay, being bactericidal, or they can be bacteriostatic, inhibiting the growth of microbes. Whereas antiviral drugs, we're looking at them targeting um, the virus, okay, and inhibiting that. So you can have a read of that. 
please leave any comments that you may have in the comments below. I'm happy to answer any questions. Otherwise, good luck for your exams.